So let's let's go to the present day and let me explain to you step by step how we use FID and how we arrive at some of these levels. Okay. Once we hit bottom and started turning back up, and there were some ways to tell, by the way, that you're hitting bottom. First of all, a FIB would have, would have predicted the approximate level at which you should turn around. But here again, it's not about predicting the future so much, you guys. I want you to let go of attachment to that. Nobody's got a crystal ball. Okay, not even if you use FIBs. FIBs point out the price levels at which something should happen. Okay, but ultimately it's still about watching, analyzing, and seeing whether it is happening where you expect it to or not. So FIBs might give you a, you know, a price level to watch somewhere around here 2070, but it's the fact that you get a bullish engulfing candle at that price level that really seals the deal. Exactly, Len. First you identify the targets, then you observe what happens at those targets. And then, depending on that information, you have either an entry or an exit. That's how it works. You know, and then I zoom into my one-hour chart and go, oh, holy crap. You know, I've got reversal candlestick formations. I've got all my indicators turning. Time to maybe think about going long. Exactly. It's, it's kind of like dominoes falling. Things happen in a sequence to trigger a trade. It's not any one thing by itself. And that's where probably some of you ran into trouble. But this indicator is supposed to be foolproof, and it just turned green. Yeah, so what? What's the context under which it turned green? That's what I'm getting at. So it's the same thing with FIBs. They're really, really useful tools when used in context and when used in combination with something else. The FIB will give you the target. The context will tell you what's happening at the target. And then your indicator, whatever your favorite one is, can confirm that a reversal is indeed happening where you expect it to. So we hit bottom, we had a bullish engulfing candle, next candle opened outside and above, and we had, you know, a little bit of an uptrend. Then we kind of lost our thrust, started dropping back down. Okay, I was looking for a while that this thing was going to come back down, maybe try to do a double bottom, until wham, Another bullish engulfing candle. It is situations like this to which fibs are the best suited. When you have the beginning of a new trend or a thrust, you have a little bit of a retracement, and then the original trend resumes. Kind of a zigzag pattern. Okay? Wherever you see a zigzag pattern, reach for the Fibonacci tool. Now, sometimes I'll spot a zigzag and draw a fib on my weekly chart. You know, and then I zoom in, zoom in, trade it, trade between those levels on my, my uh, hourly chart. Sometimes I won't see a clear zigzag on the weekly chart. That's okay, because very often then I'll see a zigzag on the daily chart. Maybe I won't see a zigzag on the daily either, but I'll see one on the four hour. The cool thing about fibs, you guys, they're time frame independent. Draw them when you do your long-term analysis, when you see a zigzag, trade them on whatever your favorite time frame happens to be. Once a price level is identified as being important, it's going to be important regardless of whatever time frame you're looking at it on. Okay, so draw them wherever you see the zigzags. And all I do is I grab my Fibonacci tool, I go down to where this trend began, call that point A, I click and I drag to the highest point reached before we started that retracement down. And I simply let go. Okay, so click from, in this case we're in an uptrend, so you draw from bottom up, always in the direction of a, the trend. In a downtrend, you draw top down. And you'll notice I'm also going wick to wick. 
Those of you who attend some of my other classes, you know I'm very fond of candle bodies for things like uh, trend lines, testing breaks and retests on support resistance. I'm fond of bodies because they represent consensus. The reason for fibs I use wicks instead is because with Fibonacci, we're measuring distance, right? How far? So for distance, it makes sense to go from the furthest point to the furthest point, or in other words, the wicks. Okay. So back to your question, now that we've got a fib up on our charts, Len, uh, retracement or expansion trading basically consists of trading from B to C. That's your third point. Okay. C is how far you retrace. For example, 50%. Right? 50. 50% 50 is halfway between A and B. You retrace half of the way. So you'll notice zero is the point where I let go of my mouse. These numbers then measure the percentage of the retracement. This is the extension. That's why all the numbers are greater than 100%. It's how far past B we've come. So what I do, you know, a lot of people say, well, your fibs look different than I've seen before. They're not really so much different. All I'm doing is I'm doing a little bit of math to get my platform to plot both the retracement and the extension simultaneously with one mouse click. Just a little bit of a time saver, nothing more. And I've got instructions how to make that modification at this link here. The first thread has a PDF file attached to it. It'll show you exactly how to make that modification with screenshots and everything. Okay. The three most common C retracements out there and their corresponding movement rules would be 3850 and 161. Okay. If your retracement goes to 38, your extension will typically go to 138. If your retracement goes to 50, then it will extend to 161. And if your retracement goes to 61, your extension more often than not will go also to 161. Those are the three most common ones, the ones you should start out trading. Okay. Some of these other guys I describe at that same link that I just posted. You just have to scroll a little bit further down in the discussion thread. And I summarize, you know, what to do at 23, what to do at 78. But start out with these three. They're by far the most common. Some of you will say, well, I was just in Wayne McDonald's class, and he teaches 38 to 161. What gives? Well, you can't go to 161 without going through 138 first. So it's not a matter of is he right, am I right. Sometimes 38 will go to 161, but always it will go through 138 first. The others are what I sometimes call the bonus rounds. And I'll, I'll explain the bonus rounds to you because we had some here even beyond the 161. Okay. Usually I trade from C to D. After D, I'll trade one Fibonacci level at a time if we break our target and then retest it as support, only under that condition. Or like here, the 200. We broke it. We came back down. We tested it from the other side. So you trade 200 to 261. So I'm not disagreeing with Mr. McDonald at all. I've actually got a lot of respect for the man as a trader. I'm simply saying I prefer, to, based on statistics, to split it up into two separate trades. Because the second one happens some of the time, not all of the time. And that kind of leads me back, Len, to why I prefer also extensions versus retracement. 